Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today we're going to talk about dispersion. So in a previous video we explored second order dispersion, which is an effect that causes an optical pulse propagate through a fiber to spread out in the time domain as we're seeing in the animation I produced right here. So the second order dispersion is the only dispersion effect that takes place. We also have third order, fourth order dispersion and so on. So I thought we'd take a bit of time to actually understand where this dispersion behavior comes from, how to analyze it and what the properties of it are. To begin, let's consider an electromagnetic wave in vacuum. Mathematically, it can be described using an amplitude and a cosine function. So in this case, omega indicates the temporal frequency, that is to say, if you pick a certain location, how many times per second does the electric field sort of wiggle up and down at that spot? We also have k0, also called the propagation constant, which is the spatial frequency. It says that at any given instant of time, imagine taking a snapshot of the wave, then if you select a certain region of space, how many times does the um, wave peak inside of that region? That's essentially what k0 tells us. It also happens that there is a relationship between k0, omega, and the propagation speed of one of these peaks, and it's simply given by k0 being uh, omega over the propagation speed, which of course for an EM wave in vacuum is just the, the speed of light. To understand why this relation holds, I think it's helpful to try and use this equation up here to track the location of one of these amplitude peaks here over time. So we can see that definitely the cosine function will have a peak whenever the argument in here is equal to zero, which for example happens when z is equal to zero and t is equal to zero. Let's say that this peak right here indicates zero time at zero location. Well, as time increases, we can see we end up subtracting a bigger and bigger number inside of the argument, which means that we need to select a higher and higher set value in order to compensate. So as time progresses, we subtract more using time, and we have to add more using z, which means that the set value where the argument is zero shifts forward. So this way we start to propagate in the forward direction. And of course, if we had a plus here instead of a, a minus, we can see that for an increasing time, we have to select a more and more negative set value, in which case this peak would be shifting to the, the left. Okay, so what happens if we send that wave into a bulk material, imagine like a solid uh, homogeneous block of, for example, silica glass? Well, in that case, it turns out that the uh, temporal frequency is unchanged, meaning that at any given location, the field will still wiggle up and down over time at the same rate as before, but the spatial frequency is actually altered. Instead of writing k0, we now write beta to indicate that it's changed inside of the material. In fact, the reason why this happens is that the speed of light is slower inside of a material compared to a vacuum. So this essentially causes the uh, speed to decrease, and then because beta is related to the optical frequency and speed following this uh, relationship as before, we find that beta is equal to simply omega over c multiplied by the refractive index. And of course, the interesting thing is that the refractive index depends on the uh, color of the light, the optical frequency, as is famously proven by uh, P. Floyd et al. in 1973. And therefore we have a sort of interesting situation where different colors of light will not only wiggle at different uh, speeds, but also propagate at different speeds and with different uh, spatial frequencies. <coughs> so of course we can create a chart of the refractive index uh, as a function of omega and then use the formula for before in order to uh, get an expression for the beta constant. And the nice thing of course is that we can measure the refractive index of a type of material independently, for example using this um, simple case of Snell's law, which you may have done yourself at some point. So it seems that if we um, have this expression here for the n value, we can get a beta value that seems like almost completely linear. Note here that I'm gonna start plotting things in terms of the actual frequency of the optical frequency, because I think it makes things a little bit more easy to understand. So anyway, it looks like the green line here is almost completely linear, but if we actually fit a linear line to this uh, graph here, we can see it's not quite the case, because down here, the green line sort of overshoots the red line a bit, then it undershoots, and then overshoots again over here. So there's a little bit of curvature to this, uh, green line here, and we're going to explore the implications of that in just a moment. But uh, first of all, let's note that if we zoom further and further into a smaller and smaller frequency range, then at least locally the beta function looks completely linear. So here we are sort of in the near infrared telecom range, as you can see. So one small question we can ask to sort of get started with our analysis of dispersion is to uh, try and understand what determines the difference in arrival time between two pulses propagating through a medium. So we can imagine sending two pulses with identical durations into a medium, but with the difference that one has a slightly higher carrier frequency than the other one. So one of them must propagate more quickly, and as soon as it reaches the end, we can activate our stopwatch. And then once the other one um, turns out at the end of the medium, we can stop the stopwatch and then measure the delay time between them. So clearly the time it takes, or the difference in time, will depend on the time for the blue pulse minus the time of the red pulse which essentially depends on one over the speed of these two pulses. So how could we determine those based on the uh, beta values we saw before? Now, first of all, to answer the question, we have to understand what we really mean by a pulse. 
Well, essentially, when we see an optical pulse, we can think of that as a superposition of a large number of waves with different amplitudes. So in this case, this pulse right here can be thought of as being composed of, let's say, a carrier frequency marked in ordinary view here, plus some frequency components that are um, oscillating more quickly in time marked in teal, and some that oscillate more slowly marked in, um, in dark blue right here. And so adding all of those up will cause them to interfere in a way that sort of uh, localizes the pulse right here with a certain sort of wiggling inside of it. And essentially that's what this mathematical expression here is telling us, that the um, behavior of the pulse in the time domain, like so, can be thought of as being composed of a large number of um, frequency components with frequency omega, with different amplitudes and of course different uh, oscillations right here. Note that again, each of these um, individual frequencies will have a different spatial frequency because of the uh, refractive index. So now let's um, take a look at a particular case here, for example, where the uh, blue frequency is close to the corresponding wavelength of 1550, and the red one is slightly below in frequency corresponding to a slightly higher wavelength. So again, in this region, we can see that the beta value here is almost completely linear. So what we can do is we can do a tail approximation of the, of the beta, beta function here. So we can see that we can mark it as a sort of constant offset centered on omega naught, and then we can have the um, the slope here beta 1, which is simply just the ordinary derivative like so. And of course, we have to multiply by this uh, offset from the carrier frequency in order to get the, the proper proper slope. Naturally, there will also be some higher order terms because, as I said before, the beta function isn't completely linear, but at least for this like very small region, it's almost going to be the, be the same. Okay, so when we substitute this approximation for beta into the expression from before, we can rearrange it a little bit in order to clean it up. So we can see that this term right here is just a constant, so we can move that outside of the integral. Then we can do a small trick, which is to multiply by 1, what would be more accurate. We will multiply by this complex exponential inside of the uh, integral, and by its complex conjugate uh, on the outside. So of course that's equivalent to just multiplying by 1. Then we can merge these two exponentials right here, and pop this part into this one, giving us the following expression here. So we have an exponential on the outside that's sort of centered on the carrier frequency, and then we have an uh, integral of a bunch of exponentials on the inside that depends on the offset away from the carrier frequency. So how can we understand these two terms? Well, it turns out that the um, exponential outside essentially describes the behavior of one of these peaks inside of the, the pulse, one of these small amplitude peaks, and how that propagates forward and changes in time. And we can simply use the equation from before to determine the phase velocity in this case will be simply omega naught divided by B0. That tells us how one of these sort of individual internal peaks move. But then we also have this expression right here, which essentially tells us how the overall envelope of the pulse moves. So this sort of uh, peak that envelops the uh, wiggling signal, how does that shift forward in time? And it turns out that we can just use the same formula again and divide the frequency by the propagation constant, giving us that the so-called group velocity is simply 1 over the uh, dispersion slope here. So this actually answers our questions, because we can say that the time delay will simply be equal to the length of the medium multiplied by the difference of these two propagation constants for these two respective pulses at their uh, individual carrier frequencies. All right, so that sort of explains how uh, beta 1 behaves and what it um, determines for the behavior of the pulse. But now let's ask a slightly different question. What happens if we, instead of looking at two different pulses, um, follow a certain pulse along as it propagates through the medium? Remember, so far we're sort of looking at the medium from the outside and then seeing the pulses propagating through it. But now we're going to look at a single pulse and sort of track that as it moves through the medium. If we do that, it sort of looks as if the pulse is like stationary and the medium is propagating this way throughout it. So to analyze that in a bit more detail, uh, let's first rewrite the expression for the pulse a little bit, where instead of looking at the actual electric field, we'll look at the um, envelope field, so to speak. And to do that, we simply get rid of the sort of wiggling behavior inside by multiplying by the complex conjugate of the outside exponential we saw before. Also, a small note that from now on, whenever I write um, beta 1, I'm going to assume that it's implicit that it's beta 1 evaluated at a certain carrier frequency. Same thing with beta 2, it's beta 2 evaluated at a certain carrier frequency, and so on, just to keep the notation a bit more simple. So if we uh, proceed, kind of similar to what we did before, we uh, can use some of the same tricks, so we can substitute in our, uh, our approximation. But this time, let's include one of the higher order terms, namely the beta 2 term. In that case, we can see that we can still use the multiply by 1 trick, and we can also use this beta naught in here to cancel this beta naught up here, and this uh, negative expression here to cancel this one, giving us this expression down here in the end, where we now have a beta 1 term, a beta 2 term, and the time right here. So now we're going to do that change of variable that switches our perspective from being uh, stationary and tracking the pulses to following the pulse along. We simply do that by introducing a new time variable, capital T, which is the, um, the time minus this um, offset here due to the, the propagation. 
So substituting this expression for lowercase t into the previous expression right here, we get the following. So we can see that uh, if we multiply out this parenthesis here, we get a term right here that can actually cancel out the one that's inside of the, uh, the dispersion expression. So with that, we acquire the following formula right here. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Now we have a dispersion term that depends on the square of the difference away from the carrier frequency. So let's try to explore in a bit more detail what that actually means. And just to reiterate, before the previous analysis, we're looking at uh, essentially two different frequency packets centered at two different carrier frequencies and how they propagate differently throughout a medium. But now we're doing something else. We're looking at just a single pulse and tracking how the individual frequencies that make up that pulse will drift out of sync as we propagate down the length of the, of the medium. So in this case, for example, you can see that we start off with just the pulse packet right here and all of the individual frequencies are in sync. But then as we propagate through the medium, these different um, frequency components will pick up different phase shifts because of this squaring term going on here, which essentially causes them to drift out of phase, which actually causes the pulse to spread out in the time domain. Again, to extend in more detail, let's actually try and plot the spectrum of this pulse along with the sort of dispersion effect right here. What we see is that um, essentially frequency components that's exactly at the, uh, the carrier frequency will be will not, will not experience any phase shift relative to itself, of course. But frequencies that are lower will experience a uh, big phase shift that actually decreases with um, with frequency, while ones that are much higher will experience a phase shift that increases with frequency, like so. So that essentially explains this behavior over here that the um, the different components will start to drift out of phase and they cause this spreading out of the of the pulse. Okay, so how do we actually find beta 2 from the graph we have before? Well, in order to find beta 1, we can simply compute the derivative of the beta function as a whole, giving us this curve right here. And note that this is an example of uh, normal dispersion over here, because in this case, we can see that moving towards lower frequencies, that is to say moving towards more red frequencies, will cause beta 1 to decrease, which causes an increase in the speed. But over here, we can see that if we move towards more red frequencies, then we have an increase in beta 1, which is a decrease in speed. So over here, red light propagates fast, or sorry, propagates slowly, and blue light propagates fast. So that's abnormal dispersion. But over here, red light propagates fast, and blue light propagates slowly. So that's normal dispersion. Anyway, now we can simply find beta 2 by computing another derivative of that function. So we simply find the second derivative of beta. So it gives us the following green chart right here of beta 2. And again, note that over here, beta 2 is positive, indicating normal dispersion. Over here, it's negative, indicating abnormal dispersion. One interesting thing we can note is that at 1550, we can see the dispersion isn't quite equal to zero, it's slightly negative actually, but there is a certain location where the um, dispersion, the second order dispersion, is exactly equal to zero, which is around uh, 13 cent approximately for, for silica, slightly higher frequency than that. So let's try and just take a look at how the um, dispersion actually affects the pulse for the case where it's normal. So in that case, as we've seen a couple of times before, the pulse is going to spread out in the time domain, and because red light propagates faster than blue light, or the red light will pull ahead, or the blue light will trail behind, giving us an overall chirp of the pulse here. And of course, if we had flipped the sign of beta 2, we'd have anomalous dispersion, in which case the blue light will pull ahead of the red light. But of course, why stop at beta 2? As we saw here, the beta 2 value even seems to change over uh, the frequency. So we can compute another derivative to find beta 3. And in this case, we get this kind of curve right here. Note, it's a little bit jagged, but that's just because the, um, the data file line I have here is like running out of resolution for computing so many derivatives. In reality, of course, it's been completely smooth. So we see that we have a positive value of beta 3 right here. So what actually happens for a pulse where beta 2 is equal to 0, but beta 3 is positive? Let's uh, maybe you can think about that for two seconds before I, I change the slide. All right, so let's take a look. We can see here that the pulse initially uh, remains Gaussian, but then very slowly it begins to spread out a little bit and actually shift to the left. And then something interesting happens. We see these little extra bumps appearing down here to the, the left but we don't see any overall chirp appearing here. We can see that we've assumed it's a very small chirp scale and still seems to be completely unchirped everywhere. So I think what's happening here is that because the um, phase shift now has sort of a X cube behavior like so, then both the red light before the carry frequency and the blue light after the carry frequency will experience a speed boost, meaning that they both start to pull ahead. And as soon as they both pull ahead and begin to overlap, they'll start to interfere, causing these bumps right here. Whereas the carrier frequency just sort of remains where it is because that's like one we're tracking because we made this uh, shift in variables from lowercase t to uppercase t. So yeah, essentially I think it's what's happening here is that red light and blue light components are pulling ahead and interfering with each other. And if we reverse the sign of beta 3, we'd simply see that these bumps appear on the other side here, like so. 
Okay, and of course, we can keep going like this and ask what happens if both beta 2 and beta 3 equal to 0, but beta 4 is greater than 0. So in that case, we can see that once again, we get a proper chirp here. We see the chirp scale has been increased now from negative 20 to 20. We see red light pulling ahead and blue light trailing behind. But this time, it doesn't seem to spread out as quickly. And furthermore, it um, seems to just develop these little uh, plateaus or bumps out front and out back. But the overall shape of the pulse actually seems to be somewhat the same. So um, I think what's happening here is that in this case, when we have fourth order dispersion by itself, then um, most of the frequencies that are close to the carrier frequency will experience a very, very small phase shift because this difference is that small and erases the fourth power becomes even smaller. So basically, the main central frequencies here are completely unchanged, which is why we retain this overall Gaussian shape. But the ones that are much further away from the carrier frequency will experience a much greater phase shift, causing them to sort of be ejected. So it's almost as if this fourth order behavior sort of cuts away the very high and very low order frequencies and then pushes them forward or pushes them backwards, as the case may be, for the, depending on the sign here. So, of course, we can keep going like this with higher and higher dispersion orders like 5th and 6th and 7th, in which case it's a bit harder to interpret, but I think the overall sort of uh, point comes across with uh, this sort of analysis. So here I've just plotted all of the different types of uh, dispersion simultaneously, so you can sort of compare and contrast. We see here that beta 2 causes it to spread out fairly, fairly quickly, and beta 3 is responsible for this sort of asymmetric uh, broadening or shift, while beta 4 is sort of more of a, let's say, higher correction to, to beta 2 in, in some sense. So let's uh, let this play off a few more frames before we move on to the, the next slide. All right, so, so far I've only discussed electromagnetic waves in bulk material. So imagine like a big block of glass that's completely homogenous. But of course in many uh, endeavors inside of optics, fiber optics, photonics, you're dealing with waveguides. That is to say, glass structures where there's a difference in directive index depending upon uh, on the spatial coordinate, and then light propagates through this kind of structure. For example, an optical fiber which has a core and a cladding the beta value that you get will be some kind of weighted average between the beta value of the core and the beta value of the, the, the cladding. So to make that a bit more precise, we can imagine a cross-section of an optical fiber with the core being in here and the cladding being around. And then we can imagine a function n of omega x and y that tells us the effective index at a certain location for a given optical frequency. Then using Maxwell's equations, we can solve for the amplitude distribution inside of that structure. And then we can say that the effective vector index will be a weighted average of the index in the core and the cladding weighted with the local power. So for example, in this case, where most of the power is located in the, the center of the, the, the waveguide, we can see that the refractive index in the center, in the core, will contribute more to the index here. But the, um, the sort of evanescent wave out here in the cladding will also contribute a little bit. So we get sort of a, a weighted average of those two behaviors. And as you can probably imagine that um, Analyzing this correctly is really uh, important if you want to design optical fibers or waveguides that have certain specified properties. This chart here actually shows the, um, the beta 2 value, but measured in terms of wavelength instead of in terms of frequency for um, different types of fibers. So I think pretty much the yellowish green curve we see here is a fiber that has mainly the same properties as bulk silica. We see it has a pseudo dispersion wavelength around 1310 and it's positive over here and negative over here. But then if you change the doping or change the geometry of the fiber a little bit, then you can shift the location of that zero dispersion wavelength over here to a different value around 1550, for example. So that'll be dispersion shifted fibers. You can also change the doping levels and other things in order to um, change the orientation of the um, dispersion curve so it becomes more flat. You can see for the purple curve here, it has like a lower dispersion value overall in this range here, and it seems to have sort of bent downwards a bit more quickly. So obviously you can you know, spend a lot of time like engineering different kinds of fibers and producing them depending on your application. Maybe you want a certain dispersion profile if you're doing telecommunications, but a different one if you're doing, let's say, superconducting generation or dealing with photonic crystal fibers. Uh, because of course, some nonlinear processes are more efficient if you have low dispersion of certain kinds of, of dispersion being present for various frequencies. So, um, if you find this sort of video interesting, feel free to check out some of my other material I've published on this uh, channel. I mainly go through nonlinear effects in optical fibers and also produce other videos on optics. So a link to the presentation slides will be available in the description, along with a short notebook that shows you how to generate these animations I've displayed in the video. So thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for more videos. Bye bye.